I want to talk about engagement letters, but I want to start um, telling you a little story about um, how I first sort of changed my mindset around what an engagement letter was. I went to see a, a local attorney, and um, this was like five years ago, and I asked him, um, hey, John, help me uh, figure something out. My, my, my bill of my uh, pay receivables are getting out of control. My clients are asking me to do stuff that we didn't previously agreed upon. Uh, people are expecting things to be done faster than what we talked about. You know, it, it looks and feels that I need a good engagement letter. So, so he says, okay, sure, let's sit down and let's go through a couple of things. So he takes out a questionnaire and he starts as asking me about my marketing and my branding and my reputation and my certifications and my capacity and my infrastructure. And, and I'm, I'm stopping him and say, wait a second, you know, I, I'm ju I just need an engagement letter. Why are you asking me all this? And then John tells me, Hector, I can take out an engagement letter from my library, slap your business name on it, charge you 500 bucks and call it a day. You want that? <laughs> you know, obviously it made me think. I was like, well, you know, now that you're putting it that way, of course it doesn't seem that that's what I want. So let, let's go, let's try this exercise. So we went through this uh, concept of actually uh, looking at everything that I do in terms of um, external factors, like my marketing, my branding, how people perceive my company, the reputation. And, and we wrote all that stuff down. And then we looked at our internal factors, like our capabilities, our skills, our capacity, our, our infrastructure, you know, what technology do we have, my staff, uh, the authority or certifications, you know, am I a CPA, am I this, am I that? And then once we spell all that stuff out, then we had a roadmap to understanding, you know, wh how are we going to approach an engagement letter? So this is sort of the intro, and I want to kind of get your head um, thinking about um, that an engagement letter is not just about wording on a paper, it's not just a contract. There's a lot of sentiments uh, felt during an engagement and client onboarding process. And the language in that engagement letter needs to speak strongly about what your company is, what it delivers, what it stands for, what you will do, what you won't do, and all the other stuff around it. So let's talk about um, the, the steps for building your own engagement letter. And, and I have to make a disclaimer, I'm not an attorney. And this is going to be recorded, so many people are going to watch this. I'm not giving legal advice. And I am not also, I am not also, um, uh, advocating that your engagement letter should be one way or it should be a different way. Um, I am basically going to show you the experience that I went through and also some of the things that I asked Michelle that she gave me some, some feedback on. And maybe this will help you uh, draft your own engagement letter from scratch using bits and pieces from other engagement letters that are out there. And then finally, once you have what you think is a really good uh, a really good uh, engagement letter, then you go to your attorney and then you ask him, hey, you know, is this ready? Is this good? What, what do you see? Um, so first of all, um, determine your pricing philosophy is one of the most important things. A lot of people don't think that whether you are uh, value pricing or fixed pricing or a blended of the two or hourly, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. And, and that is not that's not that's not true. Uh, pricing evokes all sorts of feelings for your customers. It evokes all sort of all sorts of perceptions about value, about how you do, how you work, how you are respected in the industry, how you know how you value yourself in terms of presenting your services. So so your pricing philosophy is this in my opinion is the single most important piece. And we're gonna spend some time talking about pricing philosophy and the different philosophies or methods that are out there. Then we're gonna talk about the scope of work and specifically talking about what's included and what needs to be excluded and what type of language we should be using or, or examples of language that we should be using in terms of that. And then lastly, all the other conditions, right? So things like disclaimers that that the financial statements are not audits, um, requirements, you know, what are the basic requirements that you need in order to perform the work, what documentation you need from your clients. A lot of times, we don't include, or I don't anymore, but I remember a couple of years ago, we don't include a, a long list of documentation that we need from our clients because it's sort of implied in the conversation that yes, of course I need bank statements. Of course I need check images. Of course I need deposit images. But what happens is if we don't put it in there in writing, then the clients can always take advantage of the fact that we didn't complete or we completed it wrong um, because we don't have anything to go back to. So ultimately I think 
that your engagement letter not only protects you um, as an accountant doing the service with your client, it also sets the pace about how the relationship will be from that point forward, okay? So let's start with uh, talking about pricing philosophy. So there's, there's four pricing philosophies that I know of, which is gonna be hourly pricing or hourly fee, uh, value billing, fixed pricing, and value pricing. And I'm gonna kind of break them all down so we can kind of figure out where, where you stand in there. Um, before I do that, let me do a quick polling question. I, I would love to know how people uh, currently think about uh, engagement letter process. So let me talk about hourly fees. And this is interesting. Again, I'm not making a case for hourly fees and I'm not making a case for value pricing. I'm just explaining what I've done in terms of research, okay? So single rate is when we take one, one rate, let's say it's $100, whatever it is, and doesn't matter who in the staff does what type of work, that's the rate that gets built. <clears throat> then we have the multiple rate strategy where we actually define um, different skill sets or different services or specific employees or staff within the firm and we define different rates and then we actually notify the client when we do our timesheets that you know X amount of hours was by you know a junior bookkeeper and X amount of hours was by a senior accountant or, or something like that. And then um, they, they have this crazy thing called the blended rate. And the blended rate is it's kind of interesting. What people normally do is they take, uh, so, so the client doesn't get this, this multi-layer pricing, they take the pricing of the lowest end individual and let's say for example is our junior bookkeeper and let's say that's forty dollars an hour then they get the rate of the next level person let's say it's a senior bookkeeper that does adjustments and reconciliation and stuff like that and then they take the rate of the of the most senior level let's say the accountant the one that actually makes the accounting adjustments and actually makes the tax entries and stuff like that and then they multiply all those rates times the percentage of time they typically take on a project and they come up with something called the blended rate. Now, again, some people use this. I'm not advocating for it or against it. I'm just talking about how different people use different um, different uh, rate strategies. Now, value billing, fixed pricing, and value pricing are three that are often confused. And I think it's important to define all three because they are different. Um, so value billing uh, means that there's sort of a, an implicit relationship with the client and a high level of trust. And the client kind of trusts that at the end of the engagement or at the end of the project, you're gonna give them a price that is fair, <laughs> right? And the, the issue with value billing is there's tons of subjectiveness. Um, there's always somebody saying, you know what, just charge them 800. You know what, just charge them 1,000. And, 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 and what, however that person is feeling at the moment and whatever their perception is of what the client is willing to pay because of the value we provided, that's how the prices are set. Typically with value billing, there's not much upfront pricing and there's not much fixed pricing, okay? Now, fixed pricing is a little bit different. Fixed pricing is when you take sort of a menu style uh, price sheet where you say package A, package B, package C, and then you create this sort of um, specific areas where it says, look, if you're a client A, that means you have between two and three bank accounts and you, you have between three and 400 uh, bank transactions a month, and therefore we're gonna give you this price. So fixed price means um, trying to fit every client into a box. Um, that way, they, when they shop for services, it's kind of like a menu, right? So they're picking off menu. And then value pricing, it's probably the most complex one of them all. This value pricing is not the same thing as fixed pricing. Value pricing means that we stop and have a long, deep conversation with our client about what their needs are, how they value our services, how we can possibly take care of everything that they need, and then set the price up front. And typically, um, job completion and satisfaction is guaranteed. So it's very difficult to value price something and get paid partially, right? Because value price is typically implicit that you're going to complete the work and then the satisfaction is 100% guaranteed. So that's kind of the breakdown of the three. Now, in terms of uh, comparison, I think it's interesting to compare group them in this way, fixed price and value billing, uh, how they're different is, you know, fixed pricing typically works with a good, better, best package. Um, and the problem with fixed pricing is you're going to have some engagements are going to be unprofitable and some engagements will be profitable. So fixed pricing, what typically does 
is it, it works off the numbers and statistics, right? With some you make, with some you lose, right? With some of them, we, we, we give them a fixed price, but we didn't know exactly what was gonna happen. And then we ended up spending more time and then we lose money on it. Or with fixed pricing, the client ended up being really easy. And then over time it's becoming even easier and then we're making money on it. Now, the problem with fixed pricing is it requires a consistent periodic revision. Um, and then it's very difficult to make changes of pricing over time because the client already has this expectation of, of fixed pricing. Now, value billing, it's a little bit different. Value billing, it's, again, there's a, there's a, there's a relationship that's implicit. Um, clients are, are, are typically okay with, with pricing increasing time to time as long as it's within sort of, you know, inflation rate. And, but if, you, if you're going to make a change between, you know, doing a quarter at $600 and then doing another quarter for like, a thousand bucks, clients typically get a huge shock because you know it's very subjective. We came up, we came up with that number at the end of the of the of the project. So that's kind of I would say that's also sort of uh, the, the disadvantages of doing that. Now hourly fees and value pricing these are the two that get pinned against uh, a very 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 often. And typically, when we're in an hourly fee engagement, we deal with uh, an engagement letter, right? That's, that's, tip, that's the typical term used for an hourly fee engagement. But when we do value pricing, we typically call it fixed price agreement um, because the word engagement, it's implicit that there's a time running, that there's a deposit or a, or a, uh, or a retainer. So, so the thing about hourly fees is that most accountants or, or, or service professionals like it because it protects the service professional from the downside. So by a client agreeing to pay you by the hour, you're protected of not waste of not wasting time with unbillable time, right? So everything that you do in terms of time, you can get paid for. That's why accountants like hourly fees. And quite frankly, there's many projects I still do hourly. I, I just can't find a way of value pricing them. So so there's predictability on profitability, right? Profitability on, on hourly fees are very predictable, especially when you do multiple rates, when you do the low end rate and the high end rate, because you could tie their time logs with the, with the billing very tightly. Now, value pricing, it's gaining traction. A lot of a lot of clients are not used to this. Like they get very confused when we say, no, don't worry about it. We're going to give you um, a fixed price or something like that. And that's the other key thing. When you when you when you say value pricing, don't tell your client we're going to value price it because it's confusing. Just tell the client it's going to be a fixed price. The, the word fixed price needs to be the terminology you use. Don't use value price. That's just confusing. Anyway, now with value pricing, the billing process is predictable, right? It gets because we already predetermined it. We know exactly how much we're going to do it. And for the client's perspective, it's really great because they know how much they're going to pay exactly. Now, the major challenge with value pricing I've had is um, being able to find out my profitability without timesheets and with clients that take advantage of, of, of this, we'll do everything for you type of service. Um, it's very unpredictable to know if we're going to be running out of time. So, so time management, project management, is, it's, it's a much more important piece than timesheet management uh, when it comes to value pricing. Anyway, so how, how this comes together in terms of uh, an, an engagement letter is to 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 understand what the client's per, what the accountant's perception is and what the client's perception is. Therefore, when you when you word something in an engagement letter, when you use a language, you have to make sure that you're both protecting yourself as an accountant and also not shooing the client away. So, what what are the reasons why value pricing it's still a preferred choice probably by the majority of people? It's because we um, with with, let's start with value pricing. So why, why accountants like value pricing? Because as we get better and faster and more skilled, we don't lose our capacity to charge more. As a matter of fact, with hourly fees, as we get faster, we actually make less money. So that's a big issue. The other reason why people like value pricing is no burdening on timesheets. Because one of the principles of value pricing is no more timesheets, no more profitability management for projects. Um, and also you can justify a higher overall billing rate, and we're talking about it from a far away view, because the client is typically willing to pay a premium for a guarantee, for a guaranteed um, outcome. Now, why people still like uh, hourly fees, and, and 
like I said, I have many projects that do RFE, is because sometimes I'm just afraid of, of changing a traditional system and I know hourly fee just fits better with a particular client. Um, sometimes I like to calculate job by job profitability. It's, as an accountant, I'm sort of mired in that concept. So sometimes I want to know if I made true money on that. And sometimes I need to do it to justify that an employee is, is not working to par or maybe use it as a tool to push that employee into working faster. And, and I've also, sometimes I prefer hourly fees because I'm afraid of being burnt by poorly priced engagement. This is what we call downside protection. Hourly fees protects the accountant um, on the downside of getting lost on a poorly priced project and value pricing protects the customer um, you know, in, in, into paying a maximum amount. So, so it's an interesting piece to understand that both of these are uh, sort of in conflict with each other. Now, why do clients prefer value pricing? because there is a perception that the accounting professional is aligned to their needs and is not just trying to run a clock, as I mentioned, upside protection and guaranteed outcome. Now, why do um, some clients prefer hourly fees? And trust me, I have many clients that prefer hourly fees because a lot of clients have the hope, cross their fingers, that the hour, the time that it will take you to do it hourly is going to be under that premiumly priced fixed engagement and and that hope that it will take less time gives them the perception that the lower over that there's going to be a lower over co overall cost okay all right so argument for hourly fees this will be the last one on, on pricing is both accounting professional and client have one thing in common that the perception of time is typically an equitable resource. So the constraint and resource of time is something that both people understand very clearly. This is why it's so easy to, to, to say an hourly fee and it's so easy for the clients to immediately ask for an hourly fee. But where's the argument for value pricing is that we don't really wanna spend time and then charge, we want to provide solutions. And we want to maximize what we can get from our client while we want the client to maximize what they feel they can get from us. Uh, let me switch over to um, some of the ex external factors that I talked about that, that changes how we onboard a client and ultimately the type of language that we use in, a, in an engagement letter. So your, the marketing and branding that you set um, sets a lot of expectation about quality and price. The client's perception of value, it's going to... Uh, strictly it's going to change heavily how you set your price and in an engagement letter when you have a price that you feel is you you're sort of afraid of it you, you're, you're sending the engagement letter but it looks like a high price especially if it's a value price or a fixed price you know you think about all the marketing and all the branding that you've done to get the client to the point where you're in that table setting the price and you, you could always go down from a price, but it's hard to go up, right? So if you want to negotiate with the client afterwards, and we can have a whole other session about discounts, but let's not talk about discounts. If you want to negotiate some trade-offs, um, then you start with the highest price that includes everything. So that, that would be my first tip. The, the, the second thing is how you present your services. So how you spell out what, you're in, what your scope of work is, what you will do, how you will do it, and when you will not do it. Um, sets an expectation about your skills, capabilities, and outcome, right? And that's going to be tied to the price. Time frame. Listen, a lot of people, a lot of professionals, even myself, we run into the issue where the client wants something by a week from now or they want it two weeks from now versus the client that wants it a month from now. There has to be, there has to be a relationship between the expectations of time frame and capacity. Because if a client comes to you on April 10th, and they want this very, very big project to be done by April 15th at the time that you're super, super ultra busy, you know, there has to be a huge price premium on it. And you're and in your engagement letter, spell out that we're guaranteeing it by this date and, and make sure that your price includes that. So that's another important piece is about setting up a price and the language in an engagement letter. The other piece is uh, client involvement and requirement. You need to set an expectation of trade-off. There are clients that do not want to be involved at all and they want to be hands off and they want you to do everything. And everything means you have to make phone calls and you have to call the bank and you have to log into their own bank account and look for a deposit or a check image. Or you have to go through uh, paperwork or go through spreadsheets or, or, or hunt through their filing cabinets. You know, the client involvement 
and when they're required for you, it's a trade-off that needs to be exchanged with price. If the client is going to be heavily involved in giving you the information, the information is organized, then your pr your price could be set accordingly. So that this is why it makes such a big deal about, you know, price sets everything. Now, the disclaimers are important, right? So you need to... Uh, start thinking about unknown and potential risks, you know, like, hey, what if I log into your computer remotely and then somebody and, and there's a dirty website up, you know, I'm just going to log out and, 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 and get rid of the engagement. This has happened to me, right? When I'm working with a client and logging remotely and they're looking at something that is just something I don't want to see, you know, stuff like that. So you may want to disclaim that if, you, if you're going to work remotely, we need a computer that is separate from their personal use, that is 100% for business use, and it's pretty much set up just for us. Also, you need to avoid implicit assurances. A lot of times people just assume that the work you're going to do, it's, a, it's, it's going to be sustainable by a bank and a bank's going to be able to process a loan. And it turns out that the bank is requiring a reviewed financial statement with notes, right? Or, or they assume that the work you're going to do, it's going to um, you're gonna detect fraud or detect uh, bank errors or something like that. And then somehow three months later, they say, well, you'll be doing the bookkeeping and you should have cut this earlier. So you want to make sure that you want to, uh, with language, explain, you know, what are the things that we are that we are not doing, that they're the potential risks and we just can't control. So make sure you avoid implicit assurances. Clients always have this really high expectation of that everything you will do will be perfect and it will be useful for everything. And then lastly, clear pricing, definite payment terms, set the expectation of priority, right? If you have your clear payment terms and clear pricing, clients tend to respect your work a lot, a lot more. Now, so putting all these things into consideration, it's important that we understand the concept of a good deal and a bad deal, right? So when you present your services in an engagement letter, and your engagement letter corroborates with everything you do, how you market yourself, your reputation, how you explained it, how you presented your services, what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do, what is included, what is excluded, and how, how you're going to get paid. And, what, and, and every, all these things give the client a perception of value. If that value is above the price, then the client thinks or feels it's a good deal and you're going to close it faster. If you don't have enough perceptions of value and that's lower than the price that's when the client feels it's a ripoff right i know this feels like a little bit redundant but it's an important piece to kind of keep in mind the psychology of pricing is extremely important okay um all that being said let's uh talk about high quality accounting services and and, and this whole thing this whole concept wraps up around the concept that if we uh, are able to spell out everything that we're going to do how we're going to do it in the, in the in the in the pace that we're gonna do it and meet the client's expectations and needs, um, we need to in turn uh, promise or give or understand what the client's perception of a high quality accounting service is. And and, and accountants themselves um, would also agree that this is what they strive for. This is what I strive for. So what what is a quote unquote high quality accounting services? So um, that the work is in compliance. That's one of the main reasons why people look after us, the accountants, because they want to be in compliance, they want to be uh, legal, <laughs> they want to be stay out of trouble, that sort of thing. Um, no penalties and no fees. So typically, no communication from government entities. It's a good thing, right? That's what customers kind of expect. Our, our clients expect not to get penalties and fees, even if it's something that was beyond the accountant's control. And in my experience, even the stuff beyond the accountant's control, we still kind of get blamed for penalties and fees, no matter what. Um, then, you know, the fact that it that the financial statements or whatever. Uh, the output of a work that passes muster, you know, during an audit, during um, a tax audit, or maybe a financial audit. So that's something that people perceive as high quality accounting services. Um, proactive advice about growing sales and increasing profits. And more and more clients are, are expecting um, accountants to, as they look at the numbers, to be proactively telling the client of opportunities that they see. You know, accountants are not marketing people and they're not, uh, consultants of sales and marketing and that sort of thing. But if there's something that's obvious to the accountant in terms of what's happening with sales and opportunities to increase sales and profits, um, clients are really going to perceive uh, that proactiveness as a high quality uh, service. Also, uh, on the other side of the financial statement is uh, 
proactive advice on reducing expenses and reducing risks or, or, or making our clients aware of potential risks based on what we're seeing. If we're seeing big trends in expenses or big trends in, in, um, in potential liabilities, they kind of want us to proactively give advice on that. Now, uh, the, the EC1 accurate and dependable financial statements, right? So these are uh, things that the business owner and the business manager needs to make more informed decisions. And one of the hardest ones for a lot of us is uh, in, to immediately respond to every phone call, every email, every correspondence, and a high level of communication. And if you actually go through the exercise of printing this list out, and when you sit down with the client and say, hey, how many of these are important to you? If the client highlights all of them, um, then you know uh, you start with a high price, right? Then you know that the, this client it's setting the expectation this is what they want. A lot of times we don't talk about these things up front and these are just assumed, right? So the problem is when these things are assumed by the client that you're going to do this, um, but they're not spelled out on the engagement letter, um, that's a big issue. So, so what I like to do is have these conversations about, look, what does high quality accounting services feels to you? Because obviously I'm not going to provide low quality accounting services. That's it's not a good uh, marketing uh, you know, a scheme for you, right? So you always want to offer high quality accounting services. Um, so once you spell all these things out, you put them in front of a client and you say, listen, what, what from these are your high areas of expectation? What are these are high priorities for you? And, and you can have conversations about that. And that all of a sudden elevates you to, um, to, to charge whatever price it's right because your client is going to set this expectation up front. Now, the other piece is to talk about not just the quality, let's talk about the value. Now, the value is what the clients perceive. Um, and again, as they're reading an engagement letter and as you're, they're agreeing to something and you're agreeing to something, um, you want people to kind of picture in the future um, the, the quality and the value, both. Um, and what are, what are the things that clients look in terms of value? They look at um, their initial expectations or the expectations that you set, and they want them to be exceeded. So obviously, you never want to oversell um, your capabilities because that that tends to uh, create too high of expectations and a very uh, difficult one to meet or exceed. Also, no nickel and diming. It's a really big deal for clients. Clients feel that a lot of accountants and lawyers and other service professionals um, are looking for ways to charge for this, charge for that, send an invoice for half an hour here, send an invoice for an hour there. So one of the things that I, th I find important is um, it's good to spell out in your engagement letter what are incidental services? What are additional services? That way, if you are invoicing for them, fairly so, um, the client doesn't get that nickel and diming feel. So you want to stay away from that potential uh, perception of nickel and diming in order to deliver high quality accounting service. And the last one is it's fair pricing. Okay. Um, as I talked about uh, a couple of slides ago that I talked about the quality price scale that we had that graph that said, I'll show you here real quick, that shows Everything above, in terms of value, above the price is a good deal. Everything below that, uh, below the price in terms of value is a ripoff. So you want to make sure that you have these conversations about value up front and you, you write copious notes on, on, on everything the client wants and what they expect and, and their perception of your service and, and, and about the stuff that you told them. And this is the stuff that needs to go in an engagement letter. You know, some people think about all this legalese and all these uh, language. No, spell out what your conversation about value is. Spell out what your conversation about quality is. And you'll see that the engagement letter writes itself. So let's... um. Let's narrow this down into what I call the structure of the engagement letter. And whether it's an engagement letter or a service contract or a fixed price agreement, and um, you know, I, I, I'm going to show you an example of, of mine. Um, these, are, these are the steps that I follow. Number one, define the parties involved, right? So define the, the people, the management staff, and also the company. Because sometimes you do an engagement letter to the company, but you don't actually put anybody responsible on that company. And then it becomes an issue trying to figure out who's going to respond for that. So, so, so put who the, who the company that you're doing the business with, um, or your client, but also the representatives and, and, and 
put as many representatives as possible to make sure that we close the loop there. Um, defining the scope of work and or the outcomes. And, and this is a very important piece, depending on whether you're doing an hourly engagement, then you're going to be focusing on the type of things that you do and the type of things that you bill for. And if you have different rates, of course, as we mentioned earlier, or if we're going to do a fixed price agreement, then we're going to talk about the outcome and, and, and talk a lot about the outcome because the outcome is what people are paying for. And also the, the exclusions, I think, are, are really important because uh, sometimes when the outcomes are way too vague, like you're going to do my financial statements, you know, that's so vague, you know. <laughs> you know um, so, you know, uh, it, will this be uh, a pass muster in an audit if this is a tax return, you know. So all these exclusions need to be put in there. Now, I also like to specify what work, when it's going to be doing, Right. Um, sometimes I spell out the processes, right? like we're going to log in remotely or we're going to wait for you to send us the file. So sometimes we actually spell out the processes and the steps. And we are very, very specific about the documentation that we need from clients. And the fact that if the client misses the deadline, it doesn't put us as default. That's a very common issue that we have that we promise that we'll finish it by, let's say, the 15th, but the client doesn't give us a document until the 10th. So we have to make sure that when we talk about time frame and when the clock starts ticking, you know, the clock starts ticking upon, and this is the language that I put, upon complete required documentation by client is received, right? Or upon accountant's confirmation that the required documentation by client is complete right so so that wording is important to have in there to make sure the client doesn't uh, expect the the time to be ticking um after they sign the agreement no it's it's after they give us the documents now i like to define the price and the pricing scheme the pricing strategy and the payment terms obviously that's important that's that's part of the engagement letter um a disclaimer um and and, and there's a lot of potential expectations the client may have like during your conversation, the client said, you know, I really like to find out if, if XYZ project is making me money or not. And if you don't spell out the fact that you are not going to do a project by project profitability analysis, or you are going to do a project by project profitability analysis limited to procedure A, B, and C, then be careful because the client may expect you to do that, especially with value price agreements and with uh, value billing, it's going to be very difficult for you to sort of add billing to that additional time. Now, constraints and potential costs for timing and, and quality shortfalls. A lot of times, um, because the clients give us bad information, incomplete information, or they don't give us access to it, um, that is going to create a quality shortfall sometimes when the client is vague on their explanation sometimes when they they can read their their own handwriting and checks and they say well figure it out do whatever you want you know that has a quality shortfall potential so spelling those things out are important too and i think it's very important to 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 have an ability to cancel or withdraw you know when i think of any when you think of a marriage think of the divorce when i think of a partnership think of um the, the the separation you know you want to start an agreement in which the the separation of the parties or the withdrawal from the contract it's clean that way both parties know even if both parties feel that there are, are loss they know that they can leave clean without it being a fight or turning into a lawsuit of, of some sort so that is the general structure of uh, the engagement letter service contract a fixed price, price agreement as per my perspective again once you spell all that stuff out you definitely gotta see uh, your lawyer for them to approve it now one of the things that um, i like to recommend when building the scope of work statement which is really what the, the the bulk of the engagement letter, but the, the scope of work statement is um, it's the meat and the potatoes of it. It's it's what what specifically uh, bridges the expectation gap is what states uh, explicitly what is the work, and this is called the what, when, who, how <laughs> technique, which basically instead of typing all this uh, legal jargon is we'll start with saying what are we going to do and that's literally the title of the engage of the engagement letter or at least not the engagement letter but the scope of work portion what are we going to do and then we spell it out and then we say what are we not going to do 
and then you spell it out. And then you, you type in there, when will we start the work? Literally like that. This is like literally the headings that we put on the engagement letter, right? When will we complete it? Um, start and complete, you could probably put in the same question. How we will do it? This is when we explain the process. And who will do it? You know, sometimes it's good to spell in, you know, who from the organization will be communicating with the client so the client has an idea of, um, you know, who specifically is going to be talking to them and that sort of thing. So I want to show you a generic engagement letter. I'm going to go to my website real quick where I have him, I have him in there. So um, I'm going to include this, this link is on the, on the slides that are sent on the email uh, afterwards, but I'm going to pull up that, that page where I have that information. Okay. So this is my website where I have a couple of engagement letters and I'm going to pull up this one called a uh, QuickBooks Setup Agreement Letter. So it's just called QuickBooks Setup Agreement Letter. If you're a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, this is part of your Pro Advisor Toolkit, but you can see it here. But I think um, this letters um, talk about the who, when, what technique pretty well. So the first piece of the engagement letter, uh, and these are provided by Intuit. We start by just kind of saying, hello, customer. Thank you for um, working with us, the opportunity to work with us, et cetera, et cetera. Then we start with, what are we going to do, right? This could be a question, this could be a statement. And this is where you sp we specifically say what is it that the client wants us to do. And then we're going to say what we won't do. And literally just like that, right? What we won't do, this is the stuff that we're not going to do, the stuff that is not covered. Um, the fact that this is not an audit, the fact that this is not guaranteed to pass muster in a tax audit, the fact that we're, we are, we're not verifying each document, the fact that we are not uh, hired, we're not hired to uh, detect fraud or misrepresentations or stuff like that. And then we talk about what we need from you and that, you know, that's part of the what, you know, this is where we're going to specifically say the, 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 the documents. And you can do bullet points here. Like we need, you know, bank statements. We need bank images. We need checks. When we will do it, this talks about time frame, And this is actually covering both um, when we start and when we'll finish um, both pieces of it, hardware and software warranties. So this is typically when we're working on computers and uh, we have a disclaimer saying, look, we're just working on QuickBooks. We're not really messing with the operating system. If for whatever reason your computer blows up in the middle of this whole thing, yeah, this is not what we're, this is not what we do. We, we don't we don't fix the computers. Um, we recommend to use an IT professional to install the software or troubleshoot. Don't use us for troubleshoot that sort of thing. And then we have services outside of the scope of work, which is actually not the same thing as as uh, what we won't do. So what we won't do really talks about um, the limitations of the services we provide and services outside of scope of work. Um, this is talking about stuff that we could do, but um, but it, there would be an additional fee or it would be outside of the agreement, right? Or we have to wait until we complete this engagement to start a new engagement uh, for this out of scope um, uh, kind of tasks. And then we talk about the fees, whether it's an hourly or flat fee, whatever it is. And then in this case, they use the approvals, just saying that um, both pe both of these people are in an acknowledgement. And the minute that we get the signatures, we all, we are legally bound to start the work and you're legally bound to pay us. And, you know, some of the, th there's no language in this one on how to withdraw from this contract, but I actually recommend doing that. So this is just a, an example of the who, what, uh, who, what, when letter. Let me do, let's do another one called a QB services engagement. And, and these are all going to be pretty similar because these are, these are based on the same sort of uh, template system. So there it is again, what we will do. And this is talking about, um, you know, troubleshooting QuickBooks. And then it says what we won't do, which is talking about just the fact that this is not a, an audit. And then what we need from you, again, list of documentations. So this is basically the, the same thing. So as you go through um, the sample engagement letters, and I'll, I'll post a link here on, the, on it, there, there's a couple of really interesting documents. Um, this one called the complete what we'll do guide by a CPA mutual. This is a, an insurance company that put together a real neat uh, guide. And this thing is like 50 pages. It's, it's huge. And it actually uh, 60 pages. And it actually talks about um, engagement letters for different types of uh, contracts. It talks about engagement letter for tax return and engagement letter for um, the assurance uh, set of works, which is audit review compilation. So 
um, this document in particular I recommend because this is, is really designed to protect the accountant um, and the liability of the CPA for the most part. And if you jump here to like one of these sample ones, and I'm going to go all the way down so we can actually see um, the, the sample letter that they use here. Um, there we go. Let me just, let's do this one. Okay, there's one here for um, for uh, for putting together financial statements that are going to be sent to a bank, right? Something like that. So this talks about look look at the structure of this one. This talks about nature and scope first, and then it talks about roles and specifically says what the firm is going to do. Um, this is like a sort of like a consulting, uh, financing type of engagement. Uh, and then it says what the client is going to do. So notice that this, this one has a different structure. This one is nature and scope, then roles. And then it goes to uh, results and benefits. So it talks about what is the end result of the work and, and how do you, how do you, um, how do you measure that? And then talks about some of the intangible stuff like the stuff that you can't measure, like, you know, walking into the bank with confidence and understanding your business better after this engagement, that, that's not tangible, right? We can't really put a number to that. But um, these are things that they like to spell out in this agreement. And then talks about commencement and scheduling of work. That's basically talking about time frames, right? And then here it talks about um, when the job is complete and also how the job could be terminated. And then talks about uh, fees and payments and some, some engagement letters separate fees from, from payments. Then we talk about some, there's some legal jargon here about limited liabilities and stuff like that. And then dispute resolution, right? So if there's a dispute, are we going to go to arbitration? And this is where the legal stuff comes into place. This document was actually written by um, a lawyer or a couple of lawyers. So I think it's interesting for you to look at the these that, that contain a lot of those uh, legalese terms. And then the other ones especially these six here, the ones that, that were provided by, by Intuit, um, which are more, more, more for QuickBooks services that don't have so much assurance to that. So I think uh, those are interesting to, to kind of review um, as part of the exercise. Now, if you go to the organizations that you belong to, like AICPA or AIPB or IPBC or whatever, bookkeeping, accounting, like pro advisors have those letters that I showed you, they typically will have engagement letters and, and, and samples for you to work in. Um, insurance provider, right? So insurance providers typically want to protect the accountant from being sued. So they're going to provide a plethora of engagement letters. I Google, I know this sounds you know redundant, but a lot of these resources, I literally Google them and I look for the ones that I that I really want. And it, it's needless to say, once you're done doing a, an engagement letter, if you modify one or create one, it's very prudent for you to consult your attorney um, before we actually go there. But lastly, I will, I will show you mine. And if you email me, I'll send you mine. This is something that I build over the years. I kind of have a combination between the legal terms and the, um, what I call the what, who, when strategy, where I actually define hear who all the parties are, what's an agreement, what's a document, what's a service, what's an accountant, uh, what's a staff accountant. Because I actually used, uh, when I do hourly pricing, I do split pricing. I, I split the my low level and my high level fees. I do a, a brief description of the service and it's kind of a proposal because I actually do a proposal and, a, and an agreement at the same time. Then I talk about an assessment that the client needs. So I actually do a summary of everything the client said that they wanted. And then after I do the assessment, I actually explain what is it that I'm actually going to do. And then I do the scope of work, the service. So I actually, I, I actually make it a point to write down what the client wanted, but also write down what I'm going to do. That way the client can never say, well, I told you I wanted this and it was implied that you were going to do it. And the answer is no. I wrote down what you wanted, and then I also wrote down what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. And then I spelled out how I'm going to charge, and I split if it's a service or an accountant type of work. Then I talk about payment terms, maximum, project costs. You know, I talk about that there's no maximum in the case of an open engagement. And then we talk about the agreement, termination, who can end the engagement at whatever time, and what the maximum risk of the client is if they're not um, – if they're not uh, 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 in, satisfaction, in satisfaction with the service. And then we talk about potential additional notes. We talk about what they say they want it in the future. So I write that, that in there saying the client may want that and that's gonna be priced differently and obviously uh, the signatures afterwards. So that's my engagement letter that's, that I'm not gonna say it's been reviewed by a lawyer or anything like that because I can get me in trouble. But if you 